there are two central issues that all of this cultural change ultimately brings us to that will have eternal consequences. One of those is homosexuality. I want to show, show you a few things to show you the extent to which God's view has been silenced in American civilization. Sir William Blackstone was a great British legal mind. In fact, he wrote a series of volumes, commentaries on the laws of England that held great influence over the minds and thinking of the founding fathers of these United States. In fact, uh, this writing became essentially the premier legal source of the founding fathers. So much so that Thomas Jefferson in 1810 said American lawyers used Blackstone's commentaries with the same dedication and reverence that Muslims use the Quran. That's high praise. Do you know what William Blackstone had to say about homosexuality? They never used that word, by the way. They occasionally used the word sodomy, the historically set term for this behavior, but rarely even do they use that. In his book, The Fourth, chapter the 15th of Offenses Against the Persons of Individuals, after a lengthy section talking about rape, he said what has been observed, especially with regard to the manner of proof, which ought to be more clear in proportion as the crime is the more detestable, may be applied to another offense of a still deeper malignity, the infamous crime against nature, committed either with man or beast. A crime which ought to be strictly and impartially proved, and then as strictly and impartially punished. But it is an offense of so dark a nature so easily charged in the negative so difficult to be proved that the accusation should be clearly made out for if false it deserves a punishment inferior only to that of the crime itself notice that I've less left this in old English uh, script and so you have to look closely at it he said I will not act so disagreeable part to my readers as well as myself as to dwell any longer upon a subject the very mention of which is a disgrace to human nature it will be more eligible to imitate in this respect the delicacy of our English law which treats it in its very indictments as a crime not fit to be named. And then he uses a Latin uh, sentence there which translated uh, means the horrible sin not to be named among Christians. A taciturnity observed likewise by the edict of Constantius and Constance and then he gives us another uh, lengthy Latin quotation which translated is when that crime is found which is not profitable to know we order the law to bring forth to provide justice by force of arms with an avenging sword that the infamous men be subjected to the due punishment those who are found or those who future will be found in the deed which leads me to add a word concerning its punishment this the voice of nature and of reason and the express law of God determined to be capital of which we have a signal instance long before the Jewish dispensation by the destruction of two cities by fire from heaven so that this is an universal not merely a provincial precept and our ancient law in some degree imitated this punishment by commanding such miscreants to be burnt to death though Fleta says they should be buried alive either of which punishments was indifferently used for this crime among the ancient Goths. But now the general punishment of all felonies is the same, namely by hanging. And this offense being in the times of popery, that is when a Catholic king or queen was on the throne, namely uh, only subject to ecclesiastical censures, was made single felony by the statute 25 Henry VIII C6 and felony without benefit of clergy by statute 5 Elizabeth C17 and the rule of law herein is that if both are arrived at years of discretion and then another Latin phrase which means advocates and conspirators should be punished with like punishment that was English common law it might shock it probably would shock most Americans especially those who are the liberal uh, um, 
rewriters of our culture to find that Thomas Jefferson, in writing down laws for his home state of Virginia in his uh, famous um, book known as Notes on the State of Virginia, he discussed crimes whose punishment extend to life. These were punishments that he felt should be instigated in the state of Virginia. Notice Roman numeral 2, crimes whose punishment goes to limb for both rape and sodomy. Thomas Jefferson said the penalty should be dismemberment. Thomas Jefferson. What about the original 13 states once our nation was launched? In the famous U.S. Supreme Court case Bowers v. Hardwick, Bowers was the Attorney General of the state of Georgia. 1986, the last time the court ruled consistent with history and judicial precedent, made the statement in that Supreme Court case, proscriptions against that conduct have ancient roots. And I mean they went back and showed how far back this is standard universal policy. Sodomy was a criminal offense at common law, that's what Blackstone indicated, and was forbidden by the laws of the original 13 states when they ratified the Bill of Rights. What is the position of the original 13 states with regard to the constitutionality of same-sex marriage? History is cut and dry. In fact, you might be surprised to know, under common law it was death penalty, period. As the states began to adjust some of their laws once the revolution had been completed, Connecticut, New York, Vermont, South Carolina, death penalty for homosexuality. And don't think that the other states were really softer on the subject, they just vary. Georgia, life, imprisonment, at hard labor. You know, we don't even know what hard labor is anymore. Maine, Solitary confinement up to 10 years, hard labor. Pennsylvania imprisonment at hard labor. I went on the website of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I don't know if they've removed this yet. Chapter 272, crimes against chastity, morality, decency, and good order. Section 34, crime against nature. Whoever commits the abominable, detestable crime against nature, either with mankind or with a beast, shall be punished by imprisonment in the state prison for not more than 20 years. Folks, this is standard. In fact, every one of the 50 states of this country have historically always had sodomy laws. But beginning in 1971, coming out of the 60s, all the way up to 2001, do you know that homosexual activists convinced 28 of the states to overturn their sodomy laws? In 1986, the U.S. Supreme Court said same-sex relations is not constitutionally justifiable. But then things changed. This currently sitting U.S. Supreme Court agreed to hear a case that originated in Texas. Lawrence v. Texas. In June of 2003, the highest court in the land struck down all sodomy laws for all 50 states. That is an historical fiasco, unprecedented in the history of Western civilization. And it's gone downhill since. Within six months, the highest court in the state of Massachusetts took the nod and ruled that the Commonwealth must recognize the right of homosexual couples to marry. Within six months of that event, you remember, May 17, 2004, a day that will go down in infamy in the history of this country. Homosexual and lesbian couples were issued marriage licenses in that state, the first in U.S. history to do so. Like a domino effect, every state is gradually giving consideration to this. New York, state of Washington, due to the militant minority of this uh, gay community supported by socially, politically correct liberals, the view of homosexuality that has prevailed from 1776 and before, right on down to 2003, has been just brushed aside for no legitimate legal, civil, moral reason. We are living in a civilization where a sizable percentage of people 
have embraced moral insanity. 1973, the foremost mental health organization in this country, removed from their Bible of psychiatric behavior. Homosexuality, which had historically been listed as deviant, aberrant behavior. It was mental illness. Every major mental health organization in the country quickly fell into line. The American Psychological Association, within two years, many large corporations began requiring employees to take sensitivity training to try to coerce, bully, and intimidate their employees into relinquishing their morals in order to be accepting of those who had embraced immorality as a matter and course of life. Now, Hollywood, the entertainment industry, have literally inundated television and movie theaters with their politically correct agenda to force acceptance of homosexuality in American civilization. What was once considered anathema and absolutely unacceptable and illegal on our television sets is now in our faces and being shoved down our throats. It's unbelievable the degree to which our civilization has been subjected to this conspiracy. One of the arguments is, hey, we've proven this is genetically linked. A number of cases came out in the 70s and 80s that claimed, yes, we have found genetic proof. How many of you heard about those? The liberal news media picked that up, spread that across the country, and pretty much convinced American civilization, it must be true, there is genetic proof. Guess what? I've used this term a lot this weekend. Another lie. How many of you remember Bill Clinton when he was president announcing to the country that the Human Genome Project was underway in an effort to completely map and sequence the human genetic code? How many of you remember that being completed just about a year or so ago? Oh, it made news. The project stepped forward, said we have completely mapped and sequenced the human genetic code. It is an accomplished fact. They completely sequenced the human sex chromosomes, X and Y. Do you remember the announcement that made world news? We have discovered the gay gene. No, you don't remember that announcement because it was never made. And the forces that have the opportunity to explain that, they're not going to explain that. Because they were promoting this agenda in the first place for moral reasons, not genetic. Folks, if homosexuality was genetic, the God of the Bible, who can be proven to exist, would not have condemned a person for engaging in a behavior that they could not help. Secondly, there were homosexuals who had become Christians in the first century Church of Christ at Corinth. And yet, when Paul said, such were some of you, he clearly indicated they were no longer practicing that behavior. And then, as we've said, there has been no scientific evidence forthcoming of a gay gene. And you know what's more? The fact of the matter is there have been many people who have engaged in this behavior who have ceased, reformed, and repudiated the lifestyle. Another one of the myths that has been perpetrated on American civilization. Indeed, it is a central issue in the dismantling of America's Christian heritage. And folks, I'm telling you, we don't have time to look at the twin issue of abortion and the terrible holocaust that has been perpetrated on American civilization with over 44 million children having been exterminated in the last 30 plus years. Unbelievable. The God of the universe will not allow this sort of inhumane treatment, this sort of wicked behavior to go unchecked and unchallenged forever. There will be a point at which he will call American civilization to account. When you think about the political issues that face our country, 
Upon what basis do you form your opinions? And upon what basis do you make your decision with regard to voting? You know, a lot of us are concerned about the economy. In fact, there are a number of issues that we're concerned about, like Social Security, or perhaps uh, health care. And it dawned on me that, you know what? <clears throat> about all that can be said for those issues is, it affects my pocketbook. Question, how much does the New Testament say about the extent to which money ought to affect how you live and the choices you make in terms of behavior? If Jesus Christ returns tonight and calls us to account for our behavior and wants to know why we made some of the decisions we made and we say, well, it's because I wanted to make sure I had enough money. What's he going to say? I would suggest to you that such matters should not be the ultimate and final reason for making our political choices. Well, what about education? We've seen where the American education system has declined dramatically. That's a shame. But ultimately, that's not going to be a deciding factor. What about the environment? Are you aware of any civilization in all of human history that was called to account by God and eradicated because they took the position that the spotted owl needs to be saved? No. What about the snail darter in Tennessee and the Tennessee River? No. What about any animal in all of human history that's gone extinct? There are no more. No more dodo birds. No. There are passages in the Bible that talk about, you know, God created the created order. He cares about the created order. But guess what? Animals are not humans. They don't have a soul. They are not subject to the word of God. They will not inhabit eternity. <coughs> And yet some people in this country, a large percentage of people, get lathered up over animal rights. And let me tell you something, whether they're aware of it or not, it's because they have lost their spiritual moorings and are not tied in to God's view of human reality and the world. This environment will last just as long as God wants it to last, at which time He will destroy it. We have an inflated sense of our own ability to inflict damage on our environment. You concerned about foreign policy? What about defense? Aren't you pleased that we have a strong defense? Yes. Gun control? Are you concerned about that? Well, sure. What about immigration? Don't you think it's wrong that people who are not citizens of this country are coming to this country illegally, circumventing the system, cutting out a lot of people that are legally waiting to come in? Doesn't that bother you? But I'm telling you folks, in the final analysis, that's not going to be an issue if Jesus returns tonight. What about terrorism? That ought to bother us. You know what's going to matter if Jesus comes tonight? What has been our stance on killing babies and engaging in immoral behavior? That's what's going to be at the top of the list. Don't you think we need to view politics spiritually? through the eyes of God. In fact, I would suggest to you we need to basically forget political parties, political affiliations. Benjamin Rush, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, I believe said it very well. He said, you know what, I've been alternately called an aristocrat and a democrat, I'm neither, I'm a Christocrat. I believe all power will always fail of producing order and happiness in the hands of men. You know, it's interesting that the Founding Fathers, that's a common sentiment. Here they were, creating a government, a constitution, and yet the whole time they were suspicious of the whole thing. Because they knew, you know what, men really aren't capable of doing this. God has to be the one to take care of us. So they nervously and cautiously did all of it, and the whole time they kept saying, you know, God, we hope this is right. We're trying to please you. Please bless us. Boy, that's gone. Only he who created and redeemed man 
is qualified to govern him. We'd better start looking politically from that perspective. We ought to make our voices heard. Letters are effective because they receive very little feedback. Did you know that? If suddenly a politician gets, say, 50 letters, just 50 letters, they sit up and pay attention. Because that never happens. Again, we're so busy, we don't see any importance of expressing ourselves. Isn't it interesting that for 50 years the liberal forces of society, feminists, abortionists, homosexuals, they have been mobilized, well-funded, organized, and willing to sacrifice time and effort. Look what they have accomplished in 50 years. Based on everything I've shown you, American culture is almost unrecognizable from what existed previous to 50 years ago. They've accomplished that in 50 years. I ask you, are we not willing to mobilize, organize, spend time and money? If they do, why can't we? More importantly, why won't we? I think we need to boycott Hollywood. I mean it. I am sick to death, aren't you? Of hearing these individuals who quite frankly, most of whom haven't graduated from high school, and most of whom, well, let's face it, they have oriented their entire lives pretending. That's what they do for a living. Pretend. Does that qualify you to be a social commentator? To tell other people what they ought to believe about moral issues? They don't have the right to stand up and spew their leftist liberal ideas upon our person. And I've already suggested to you, what do we do about it? We go shell out money, large sums of money, to watch their movies, buy their videos, watch the shows where they get awarded and all that stuff. What's the matter with us? Do you know if the American public, the moral majority, I believe that's still the case, it's swiftly evaporating but currently the moral majority if they said alright that's it we're not going to spend another dime that in any way advances any of the people of Hollywood they would start feeling the pinch in a short while and you know what they would do like a bunch of crybabies they would start whining and moaning about how life is so terrible and you can't do that to us we got our rights We have more power. Moral power is the strongest force on the planet. And God would back us. But you know what? We like to go watch movies. We like to spend our casual time in diversion that involves their performances. We'd better wake up. We'd better modify our comfort level at least that much in order to make the truth clear to our civilization and our generation. Let me suggest to you that we need to determine to be resolute, steadfast, and unmovable. America did not get in the fix that it's in overnight. Therefore, it will not be pulled out of this mess overnight. It's going to take a sizable number of moral people that have the moral fortitude the uh, courage, the moral courage to stand up to take abuse and I assure you the persecution will be heaped upon us when we try to withstand these sinister forces that are sweeping over our society. But if we will do it and stay with it. Do you remember when because of uh, Disney's promotion and encouragement for example of homosexuality they would have a gay day at their uh, one of their uh, amusement parks. And you remember the largest Protestant denomination in the country, the Southern Baptist Convention, stood up and said, we're calling for a boycott of Disney products. And you remember that spread across our culture and a lot of people that shared moral values implemented this boycott. You remember how long it lasted? <laughs> About two minutes. But you know what? It actually worked. I mean, it had an impact. They lost money. But you don't hear anything about it now. 
And as a matter of course, good Christian type people constantly take their children to, uh, to those locations and purchase the videos. Again, we've just basically thrown in the towel, what's the point? And besides, we want to watch this movie. Unless we are willing to sacrifice, unless we are willing to stand up and have the courage to stand behind the values that we claim to possess, Satan will continue to have a heyday in American civilization. We need to be patient and we need to be persistent. You know something else we need to do? And I added this only because after reading speech after speech, writing after writing of these initial founders, it dawned on me, you know, we need to go back and learn our Bibles at least as well as they knew their Bibles. Where as you face life and deal with circumstances that happen in life, scriptures come out of your mind and out of your mouth, dealing with the circuit. You know, that sounds like Jesus. In Matthew chapter 4, when he faced terrible temptation from Satan himself, every time Satan challenged and tried to prod and to lure, Jesus said, well, you know what the Bible says. And I've shown you quote after quote, instant after instance, where that's exactly how the Founding Fathers handled their circumstances. If we do not get busy and bathe our spirits with the Word of God, shame on us. If we don't care enough to, to know what God thinks about things, to so embed into our consciences and our attitudes God's perspective, God's view, you know what that, that's doing? That's becoming acquainted more with God. We claim to be acquainted with God, and yet, how much do we really know what He thinks? In 1 Corinthians 2, the only way for you to know what God thinks is through His Spirit, who has given us words found in Scripture. The Founding Fathers knew that. They knew that. They talked about the Word of God constantly as you have seen. We Christians have our work cut out for us. We do. What is that work? If I could summarize, you know, just boil all this down, what is the number one thing we need to do? Evangelize. Which means what? That means get the message out. Get the word out. Teach. That's what the Founding Fathers did. They put Bible in the school. They put Bible in the government. They put Bible in public life. That's what we need to do. We need to expose our civilization to God's words. Now, I'll grant you, we may be at a point of no return. In fact, if you want my personal opinion, based not on my own subjective assessment, but just looking back over Bible history and looking at inspired writ, telling us here's how things have gone in the past, I would say America's probably too far gone to be recalled in sufficient numbers to avoid ultimate demise. But I believe God wants us to make every effort. Because there are people who will turn around and listen. There are still some receptive hearts. Are the majority of Americans probably, perhaps, maybe so embedded in their comfort lifestyle that they're probably not going to demonstrate the spiritual fortitude to pull out of the nosedive? Probably so. But there are still people who will listen. And how will they hear if those who know God's Word do not express it publicly? We've been bullied. We've been made to feel, okay, you believe what you want, that's fine. You know, we're not going to send you to jail yet for that, although they're working on it. Oh, yes. Did you know in the city of Philadelphia there was a big homosexual rally about six months ago? Four individuals who claimed to be Christian went to a street corner, opened their Bibles, and simply read scriptures pertaining to homosexuality. A militant homosexual group pressed in around them and became very hostile. Police were called, they arrived, arrested the four, put them in jail, and then proceeded to line up charges against them that would have amounted to something like 47 years in prison. 
And I suspect they would have pushed that and accomplished their objective. But a, a legal organization that claims to go around the country trying to defend the Christian cause stepped in and began to challenge those who were pressing that agenda. They backed off and decided to drop the case. But folks, that's just the beginning. You know one of the laws they were said to have broken? They were engaging in racist hate speech. Do you understand that we are actually at the time in our history, this isn't off in the future, this is now, where to simply read scripture, to tell people what the Bible says is deemed hate speech. I'm telling you again, if the founding fathers were here, they wouldn't, they'd clutch their chest and fall over from a heart attack. They would not believe that could ever happen in this land of the free and the home of the brave. Where to speak of God and to tell people what morality is from God's view is considered mean and ugly and hateful and illegal? Unbelievable. How could this happen? What are we going to do about it? I know you and I don't have probably much respect for the values and the thinking of France. But in 1831, our nation was 50 years old. A French philosopher, historian, politician, Alexis de Tocqueville, came to this country for the express purpose of assessing American institutions. Figure out what's happened in this republic. What are they about? What makes them tick? He spent less than a year fall, winter, traveling around then America, which, you know, would be probably east of the Mississippi River, north and south, all the way to the east coast, with a friend, a traveling companion, went back home, wrote a two-volume assessment, evaluating American civilization, eventually published as a single volume today. It's pretty thick if you'd like to get a copy and read it for yourself. I believe... Um, that he said some things that were right on target. He assessed, he put his finger to the pulse of America and correctly assessed what was taking place and went and wrote about it, published it under the title Democracy in America, 1835. Let me give you a couple of excerpts. There is no country in the world where the Christian religion retains a greater influence over the souls of men than in America. And there can be no greater proof of its utility and of its conformity to human nature than that its influence is powerfully felt over the most enlightened and free nation of the earth. That's high praise. Christianity therefore reigns without obstacle, by universal consent. The consequence is, as I have before observed, that every principle of the moral world is fixed and determinate. Is that any longer the case? You know, you have your morality and I have mine. It's not the way it was in 1830. The revolutionists of America are obliged to profess an ostensible respect for Christianity, for Christian morality and equity, which does not permit them to violate wantonly the laws that oppose their designs, while the law permits the Americans to do what they please. Religion prevents them from conceiving and forbids them to commit what is rash or unjust? I don't know whether all Americans have a sincere faith in their religion, for who can search the human heart? But I am certain that they hold it to be indispensable to the maintenance of republican institutions. Republic. This opinion is not peculiar to a class of citizens or to a party. It belongs to the whole nation and every rank of society. The Americans combined the notions of Christianity and of liberty 
so intimately in their minds that it's impossible to make them conceive the one without the other. Two questions. How is it possible that a society should escape destruction if the moral tie is not strengthened in proportion as the political tie is relaxed? And what can be done with a people who are their own masters if they are not submissive to the deity, which in ancient America was the God of the Bible? These are rhetorical questions. They carry their own answer. Folks, are we living in an America now where rather than the moral tie being strengthened in proportion to our freedom, just the opposite has happened. The moral tie is being relaxed. Do we not live in a society now where people's attitude about being their own masters means forget God, forget religion? Yes. Those are the societal circumstances we now face. They predominate. According to this gentleman, he said then, it's not, it's not possible. It is not possible for that society to escape destruction. On what is America's liberty and freedom based? You know, I mentioned to you that our president has, has stated that we, you know, we want to go to a country like Iraq that is basically Islamic through and through. We want to give them a democracy. We want to let them have a taste of freedom and liberty. Okay? How do you accomplish that? How do you achieve the kind of freedom that was originally instigated in this country? How do you accomplish that? Is it to be based upon the economy? If we have a strong, robust economy, the Founding Fathers said, no, 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 that's, that's not it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have anything to do with it. It's interesting as you read the Old Testament, for example, the book of Kings, it has as its central thesis... What is the key to national success, prosperity, and health? And the answer, as the king and the people go morally and spiritually, so goes the nation. They lose their attachment to God, they go down the tubes. That's kings. Founding fathers. Understood, recognized, believed that very thing. No, the economy's not going to do it. But what about a strong military? You know what they would say? Mm -mm. By the way, they didn't have a strong military when they won the revolution. <laughs> Remember uh, how Jericho was taken? Wasn't by a strong military. Nope. What about health care? <laughs> We're in big trouble there. Health care is out of control. It's expensive. No, that's, that's not what freedom's based upon. The Founding Fathers said our freedom is based upon morality. Remember what Washington said in his farewell address? Well, what morality are you talking about? Well, Thomas Jefferson said there's only, I know of only one code of morality for man. Oh, then you're talking about morality that came from the multiplicity of gods believed by Hindus. Is that what the Founding Fathers said? Absolutely not. What about Buddhism? Do you know how much Buddhism is going on in our country? Do you know how many Buddhist temples are in America? I went to a Hindu temple in Dallas several years ago. Where a wooden deity amid... Uh, fine fabric was worshipped by people who came in to worship this wooden deity. In fact, he was, he was, it was woke up at 6 a.m. every morning, bathed, dressed. That process repeated four times before he was put to bed at 6, 7 o'clock at night. I'm not making that up. Founding fathers would have been horrified. Would they have said our morality is based upon Judaism? Absolutely not. Islam? Judeo-Christian Islamic value? No. Sorry. I showed you a Supreme Court case where the judge declared Muhammad to be an imposter. Don't represent true religion. No, they were very clear. Their morality was not based on a lack of religion. You know, just kind of neutrality or religion-less. I'm telling you they would be horrified. They would not have permitted 
atheists to be in the positions that they are in in our society spreading their unbelief. They were very clear. America's freedom depends upon Christian morality. That's it, cut and dried. No one can successfully deny that that was their thinking. There's no question, folks, I believe I've proven to you, without really giving my opinion, I mean, I've said a lot, but every time I've shown you something, it has been a quotation. I can show you the sources, the original sources from which they came. The massive evidence shows that these founders were predominantly Christian. They had a world view based on the Bible. America was intended to be Christian in its orientation, even though there have been exceptions and failures like slavery that was allowed to continue, though efforts were made to expunge it. I wish I had time to uh, give you the founders' views on this. Most of them were members of abolitionist societies. Came to a head in the 1860s and finally really was not fully rectified until the 1950s and 60s. That's a shame. That's a blight on America. But you cannot say that the foundations of our nation were responsible for that. Christianity doesn't advocate slavery. Our nation was intended originally to have these original ideals that were rooted in the Christian religion with open acknowledgement of, the, of their reliance on God. God indeed has blessed America because of this initial intention that was manifested by these men. Listen to what the psalmist said. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The implication being a nation will not ultimately be blessed if their God is not the God of heaven. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. Do you think God knows what really is going on in this country? Yeah. You know, as life goes on, we may be like Habakkuk and say, God, how long are you going to let this happen? Are you not paying attention to what's going on here? Oh, he knows. He knows, it. He knows better than us. Every nook and cranny of our country, God knows what people are doing. No king is saved by the multitude of an army. Folks, we need to look at this very, very closely. Are you going to sit here and tell me that after 911, even though you're a little bit concerned about what could happen on our own shores, are you going to sit here and tell me that really, though, deep down, you have some confidence in our ability to defend ourselves? We have the world's, I would say, history's best military. Our technology, our, our capability is beyond compare. And that doesn't give you just a little bit of sense of security. You know what the psalmist said? Don't let it. Don't fall for that. No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. The horse is a vain hope for safety. If you want to plug in updated terminology, it's not going to be... You know, the smart bombs and the uh, Black Hawk helicopters and all this tremendous technology that we have accomplished. Put it into the verse. It ain't going to save us. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Do you believe God or not? That's a declaration that's cut and dry. Then what will? Where is our protection to be found? Behold. The eye of the Lord is on. That's a way to say God's protecting favor and care is imparted to those who fear Him. Which in Psalms means the people who embrace His word and comply and conform their lives to His will. On those who hope in His mercy. That's our only hope, folks. If that is the case, I'm telling you, we're in trouble. Do you remember one of the thematic expressions or statements of the book of Judges, which describes the dark ages of Jewish history, 300, 350 years of moral <laughs> calamity, mess? Look at this statement. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord. I got to thinking about this verse. This fits America. The last generation in this country 
that emulated and lived the traditional American values that characterized our nation from the beginning. Called by Tom Brokaw in his book, The Greatest Generation. By the way, what's that say about my generation of baby boomers? <laughs> and the two cents. Do you understand that the majority of that generation has now departed the earth? More and more swiftly every day. I believe that we could look at this verse if the Lord will allow me to make the application. When all the World War II generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation, that would be the 60s crowd, arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for this country. I believe that's a fair application of Scripture. Thus entered the dark ages of Jewish history, replete with moral degeneration, horrible atrocities, homosexuality, rape, bloodshed. It's a terrible picture. The faithful few were largely unknown and ignored. The psalmist also said that God has rebuked the nations. Oh yes, many through history. He has destroyed the wicked, blotted out their names, some of them forever and ever. Do you know archaeologists have uncovered in very barren, arid, desolate parts of the world where they thought no human habitation ever occurred here. They have dug around and uncovered entire civilizations that no one even knew about. The more they dig, the more they check around, they find out that, boy, these people were involved in some pretty wicked stuff. God told us about what he did to Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you think God's obligated to tell us about every city and every nation that he's done that to? No, there'd be no reason for him to tell us about every time that's happened. The evidence shows it's happened many times. And God does not change. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will administer judgment for the peoples in uprightness. The nations have sunk down in the pit which they made. In the net which they hid, their own foot is caught. The Lord is known by the judgment he executes. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. The wicked will be turned into hell. And all nations that forget God. Do you believe the psalmist or not? God's timetable is rarely what we think it ought to be. But it is certain. It is inevitable. Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged in your sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. America needs a good, healthy dose of humility and submission to the one true God. But you know what? The time has come where the average American will not endure sound teaching, but instead they have heaped to themselves teachers after their own lusts turned away from the truth and have been turned aside unto fables. Does that describe America? But the Hebrews writer said, See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. That is a warning. And the writer of Chronicles, looking back over centuries of human history and Israelite history, made some very insightful observations. Quoting God, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin, heal their land. My eyes will be open, my ears attentive to prayer. That's God. By the way, that's the verse that Ronald Reagan took the oath of office on. Had his Bible open to that passage. But, if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments which I've set before you and you go and serve other gods, that's a good description of America. Literally and spiritually. And worship them, I will uproot them from my land which I have given them. And this house which I have sanctified for my name, I will cast out of my sight. 
I will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. As for this house which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and say, Why has the Lord done thus to this land and this house? And you know what the answer will be? Because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers. They embraced other gods. They worshipped them and served them. That's why he brought all this calamity upon them. History repeats itself over and over. God calls upon this nation to return to him. In fact, righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. May God bless America. May God bless his people in their efforts to represent him accurately, forcefully, publicly to a civilization that is literally rushing down a precipice to ultimate destruction. God is waiting for us to stand up and be his mouthpiece. May God bless us to that end.